And uh, we can uh, move uh, now to our last uh, presentation for this session. And uh, the, the presenter is uh, Dor Lavi. And uh, it is um, a paper from the industry track. The title of the paper is um, Learning to Match Job Candidates Using Multilingual B Encoder BERT. So thank you. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. My name is Dor Lavi. And today I'm going to show you how we uh, match between jobs and uh, candidates in uh, Randstad. So we're first going to uh, do a bit of introduction about uh, Randstad. We're then going to move and formulate our goal, talk about uh, the challenges achieving that goal, and then talk about our solution and uh, evaluate it. So who are we? Randstad is an HR uh, leader. We operate in 38 different markets. We are where we are situated at the top three in most of them. You can see a few figures in, in the slide, but the most important one is that we employ a massive amount of people on a daily basis. You can see here that we supply many different services to both clients, which are companies that are looking for people, and for talents, which are people looking for jobs. But right in the center, at the core of what we do is try to match between those two parties, right? We try to match the, the clients and the talents. So this is a very nice overview, but that, what does it mean technically, right? We mainly have two types of uh, data. The first is the talent data, where we have first and foremost the, uh, the CV, which is usually a PDF file, which then is parsed into uh, text. We also have a bunch of structured data, which is many different things, for example, languages, driving license, where the, that person lived. And the second part of, of, the, of that uh, data side, let's say, is the vacancy data, where we have the comparable uh, structure data, for example, where the uh, vacancy is, uh, where the position is situated. But of course, we also have the job description. All those data is being transformed into features. Those features are then be being fed uh, as input into different uh, recommendation system and different rankers. So this is a very big uh, overview of how we do a uh, recommendation system in Randstad. But the, the focus of what we're going to do today is those two parts, is how to construct those embeddings meaningfully. So actually, without even noticing, we just formulated our goal, which is how to create meaningful numerical representation of our text. What are the challenges achieving that goal? We have mainly three, uh, three challenges. The first one is that the data is extremely noisy. CV are user-generated and, by definition, inherently uh, noisy uh, pieces of text. On the other side, job descriptions are usually constructed a bit better and uh, behave nicely. The second challenge is complementary data. Most literature out there is usually matching between two similar pieces of text with the same semantic meanings, while we have uh, complementary uh, meanings. The third challenge that we're facing is multilinguality. Because we operate in so many different uh, uh, markets out there, we cannot train a model per, uh, per language. And, and actually, even if we could, in many markets that we work, we, uh, we operate in, in multiple languages. For example, Netherlands, if most of the job description are in Dutch, but many of the CVs are in English. So in order to come up with a good match, to find the best match, we need to even not have being a, a uh, not, not to have a multilingual model, but even a cross-lingual model that will be able to match between those in English and, and Dutch. So let's jump, jump right into the heart of our solution and see, see what we did. First, let's start with the data set that we got. So we leveraged our insights and, and uh, 60 years of experience as a corporate, and we talked with our business uh, stakeholders, and we we were able to identify two types of uh, signals. The first is the positive signal, where we said any kind of interaction between a recruiter and a, and a talent, for example, a phone call, an interview, a job offer, all of that considered as a positive signal. On the other side, we have the negative uh, signal, which is the lack of that uh, interaction, meaning a consultant, uh, a recruiter, look at that profile of that talent, but decided not to pick up the phone and rejected that profile. 
Next, in order to properly evaluate our model, we need uh, uh, to come up with a few baselines, right? So we created actually two types of uh, baseline. The first one is the unsupervised one, where we did the most naive thing uh, that we could think of, where, which is taking the CV and the job description, feeding them into a TFIDF, getting back the, the embeddings, and measuring the cosine similarity uh, between the two. The second thing that we did was uh, to try to understand the, the vocabulary gap between those two documents and to uh, leverage the much hyped uh, BERT, we tried to use the same setup with, uh, with a BERT uh, transformer. Second, we said maybe we can find a direct mapping between or learn a direct mapping between the, 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 two, kind, the two documents, uh, which means that we did kind of the same, uh, the same setup just instead of using cosine similarity, this time we uh, fitted the embeddings into a random forest, which those random forests were uh, trained on the data set that I explained a slide ago. Next, and finally, I mean, I would like to show you our architecture and what we uh, decided to do. This is a multilingual BERT that is trained, uh, sorry, not trained, but fine-tuned in a bi-encoder way. It is uh, inspired by SBERT, actually where in our work we show that it can, uh, we can effectively match between documents and not sentences, where this is uh, where mainly what uh, BERT is uh, used for. And second is that we also able to match between two complementary pieces of text and not we, without the same semantic meaning. So here you can see that we take the job description and the CV, feed them into the same uh, BERT model, taking the pooling layer and then measuring the cosine similarity, and then fine tuning all of that uh, again, based on the data set uh, be from before. So this is our best architecture that we, ca we came up with, but it's certainly not the first. We did lots of experiments be before we got uh, to that uh, point. For example, instead of cosine similarity, we also experimented with softmax, and instead of using the pooling layer, we also experimented with using the CLS token and the last four layers, as many times suggested in the uh, literature. And because BERT and SBERT are used on sentences, we also tested sentences instead of documents and even uh, words. So let's jump into and see how, uh, how our model uh, performed. So here you can see the rock oak of the first two baselines, which is uh, uh, the BERT and the TFIDF, and you can see that they get 0.53 and 0.57 uh, respectively, which is a bit higher than the 0.5 uh, random, right, the minimum. And when we add the random forest to them, we see that the performance is better. We, get, we have a better performance of 0.69 and 0.71 for BERT and TFIDF, uh, respectively. But it's still not as high as our uh, architecture, which get 0.84 both for uh, with cosine and random forest. Of course, Rock Oak was our main metric, but we also uh, measured a bunch of other metrics. But they show similar pictures, so I won't uh, dwell into it. Another way to look at the results is to look at the distributions uh, of, uh, of our uh, results, right? So you can see at the, at the left two columns, you see TFIDF and BERT, and you can see that, sorry, let's start with, with the, what the colors, because I, I guess that you don't see them, but the, the blue one is, is the negative samples, the negative pairs, and the orange one is the positive uh, pairs. And you can see that the, the two left columns, the t uh, TFIDF and BERT, find it very difficult to differentiate between those two uh, uh, distributions, right? Even especially in the cosine, in the top row, and in the bottom row, you see a bit of differentiation, but still uh, hardly. On the right column, on the other hand, you see a, a very nice uh, differentiation between the two uh, samples. Last way to, to look at the results is to look at a few examples. And, and here I would like to uh, show that on the left side we have few, uh, few sentences that represent uh, CVs, and at the bottom we have few sentences that represent job description. So the first row, first sentence, both in the left and at the bottom, is a, a warehouse or a logistic worker, and the second is a teacher. And the third and fourth rows are just the translation to Dutch of those uh, first and second uh, sentences. Two things that I would like to emphasize uh, in here is that if you look at the first sentence, both at the left and the bottom, is that at the left side we have a warehouse worker, while at the bottom we have a logistic worker, right? So it is the same position, it is the same role, but we introduce on purpose a uh, word, uh, word uh, vocabulary gap, sorry. Second thing that I would like to emphasize is that with that kind of setup, we also uh, get to test uh, cross, uh, cross linguality, right? In the first row, third cell, for example, we have a job description in Dutch and a CV in English. 
So as you can imagine, TF-IDF perform pretty poorly uh, in this setup. Uh, and that, that is because of that uh, vocabulary gap that, that we introduce. But our hope was that BERT will be able to achieve a bit better uh, performance, which is kind of true, right? In the first cell, you see 0.57. So you see that we get some kind of a, a higher score uh, of the positive uh, pair of logistic worker. And, but on the, on the other hand, on the negative sample, on the first row, still on the first row, but second, uh, second column, you see still pretty high score of 0.49 between the teacher and the warehouse uh, worker, not to mention the third cell, which is the cross-lingual, which is even a lower score. With our, in our setup, you see this nice checkerboard where all the positive pairs have a higher score and all the, the negative samples have a much lower scores, both in the, in the same language and cross-lingual. Um, and, and that's uh, achieving actually the better performance uh, than, than what we saw before. So with that positive note, I would like to just thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the talk just as much as I enjoyed working on it. If you have questions, this is my email or you can reach out in the hall at the back. Thank you. So thank you, Dor, for your presentation. I, I, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, one, if uh, you had the, the opportunity to do any online testing. Uh, uh, any online testing? Yes. Not yet. Not it, it's, yet. Still in the, it's still in I the pipeline, of course. We are industry uh, uh, after all, but, but not, not yet. It is in the pipeline. And the second question I, I, I have is, uh, um, I, I, you were showing us uh, the example uh, you know, with um, two languages, uh, some um, point examples. Do you have also... Uh, numbers like you see or precision or recall but um, tailored uh, on a part of your um, users and cvs that are in different languages so i i, I assume that the the overall performance metrics that you did show were a kind of average over a wide data set i was wondering how it performs uh, the, the different uh, algorithms perform when you are using uh, uh, let's say data with the uh, the same language versus data with different languages. I don't know if you have this number. So, so we don't have it here, of course, but, but we did uh, check the performance and, and not even on, on different languages, right? So uh, even on different types of roles, you can imagine that when you have uh, customer service uh, kind of roles and when you have logistic people roles, I mean, you, you also uh, have different performance sometimes. So we tested all of that and yeah, the, the performance is, is better. Again, it's not perfect, we still always have place to improvement, but it is better uh, on, on all those uh, aspects. Well, thank oh. you. And I see we have uh, yeah. people in the audience. Uh, please. Yeah. Hi, a very interesting talk. Thank you. So I was just wondering, do you take into account gender bias when you're trying to match CVs to job descriptions? Because, you know, it's a known fact that women tend not to apply to jobs unless they tick all the boxes and job descriptions, they tend to be a little bit over optimistic. So how do, you, how do you handle these situations? So, so it's a great question Gen in, in general on, on bias and discrimination, right? We had a keynote yesterday exactly on that and on, on the fact that AI is very regulated and HR industry is very at the top for good reasons. In, it's out of the scope of, the, of this, this paper, uh, but, but we do have uh, monitoring and we do have lots of work around fairness on uh, gender, on nationality, on uh, age groups. And uh, yeah, maybe next year we'll uh, do another paper on that, but we, we do have work on it. It's just outside of that. But maybe inside, still inside of the scope of, of this, uh, this paper is that using this cross-lingual model is something that we try to mitigate discrimination as well, right? Not, not gender uh, discrimination, but nationality discrimination, because you need to imagine that people that will submit their CV in English in Netherlands are usually comes from specific nationality. I mean, not specific nationality, but just not Dutch, uh, let's say. So. All right, yeah. great, thank you. Sure. And we have a really many, many questions also from the online audience. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions, one from the uh, online audience and, and uh, the last one from the, uh, uh, sure. the audience here. So uh, one of the questions is, uh, how did you deal with the token limit of BERT for long documents? So BERT got a 512 uh, tokens uh, limit to those that uh, are not aware. And then the question is, is, what do you do when it's longer? Um, 
so we tested, again, we tested the words and sentences just because of that, uh, that, that problem. Uh, at the end, we used uh, documents. Luckily for us, most of our documents fit into that, uh, that limit. And for those that do not fit, we do some pre-processing of finding the best 500 uh, tokens uh, for it. But, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but there are other approaches, but that's, that's what worked for us. Uh, Thanks. And we can take a, a last question. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that um, you, in order to collect your data, you uh, look at positive interactions. Uh, so your positive samples would be when there's an interaction between a recruiter and, uh, and the candidate. But uh, are you taking into consideration the fact that some companies, because of their reputation, uh, will have just a lot more higher quality candidates that some other companies that might be more inclined to maybe contact candidates that are lower quality or, you know, not, not as good as matches. So for, for us, I, I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding the question, but I'll try to answer in, in any case. If not, uh, maybe ask give an example. Say yeah, that, you know, if you're a small company, a small software developer, you might be more inclined to reach out to a candidate that doesn't necessarily fit into the job description versus if you're like Amazon or Google or Facebook, you're going to like look for a candidate that matches exactly the description. Interesting. Maybe mm -hmm. it will be more rev relevant in, in the future because for now this tool is used only internally. So we are we have an army of consultants, of recruiters, and I yeah I presume that uh, most of them operate pretty much uh, the same. So I don't think that we we have this kind of issue that we're talking about. But we are in the future going to open it to our clients as well, so their recruiters will be able to use it. But and then maybe uh, that uh, concern will be valid. Is that answering the question? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you, thank you again though, for your, you. your presentation. So <laughs> thank you everyone for attending this session and uh, we can uh, now have our uh, coffee break.